Good afternoon, and welcome to this episode of CIO Leadership Live. I'm Mary Fran Johnson, the Executive Director of CIO Programs, and I'm going to be talking today with CIO Ron Garrier of Farmers Insurance Group of Companies. Before we get started, I'll give you just a little background on Ron. Before he joined Farmers two years ago, he spent 20 years at Toyota in a variety of IT leadership roles, including CTO of Toyota America. In 2013, he moved into the CIO role at Toyota Financial Services, where he championed the creation of an award-winning innovation lab. Now at Farmers, Ron is a member of the company's executive board and also the Zurich Insurance Global IT Committee. And like so many CIOs today, his job is quite multifaceted. He provides leadership for all of IT across the company while also driving innovation and business partnerships across the company as well. Farmers, for those of you who don't know it from its very entertaining commercials on TV, is a Fortune 500 company that insures automobiles, homes, and small businesses, serving more than 10 million households. The company works with more than 50,000 independent agents and has about 22,000 employees. So Ron, welcome. It's great to have you here with us today. Let's start out by talking a little bit about the industry transition that you made from automaker to an insurer. I'm always interested when CIOs move between industries. What was the biggest adjustment for you in moving not just to a different industry, but to a much larger IT organization? Great question. And first and foremost, thank you, Mary Fran, for the invite. Oh, yeah. um, looking forward for the, the time we have. And uh, apologies for the slight delay. Um, so the transition, the, the really exciting thing for me was when I worked at Toyota for the, the 19 or so years I was there, I was responsible on the financial services side of the house. So those experiences were very F&I based. So for me, it was a little bit easier to make the transition from a finance, uh, captive finance to an insurer. Okay. Um, I did have some experience on the motor sales side. I actually started on the motor sales side, actually finance side. Mm -hmm. um, started doing repossessions. That was my first job at Toyota Financial Services in my hometown of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And then Y2K was the big buzz. And from Y2K, I, I jumped into the IT side because everyone was scared that the world's going to stop. Yeah. And then I stayed in the IT side, but then made the transition more into financial services. But I would say the, the biggest difference um, is just your mindset of kind of the insurance um, industry. Uh, you think of things differently that you never thought of before. You think of peril, you think of weather conditions. Those things definitely are part of kind of the insurance landscape mm -hmm. and things that I never would have thought of before, like uh, hurricanes impact or the fact here in LA today, uh, there are wildfires nearby mm -hmm. and um, I have to think of it differently because then we have to deploy catastrophe um, materials and individuals to help out. So yeah, the mindset is because the industry is slightly different than, yeah. than I've ever seen before. Well, and, and it, it seems to just comparing industry to industry that it's almost more, it's a closer connection. Uh, it's kind of a closer human connection to the customers. A absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and you provide a policy, but then you have to be there at their time of need. And that could be at 2 a.m. Yeah. So your systems have to be up at all times. Yes. Yes. Well, yeah, I can see that there'd be a million IT implications with that. How did you get yourself up to speed on the insurance industry as you were coming in from the automotive side? What were what was kind of your first hundred days? What what sort of people did you talk to? How did you get up to speed? That's a great question. So getting up to speed in this industry, I would say one of the first things I did is I asked a lot of questions. It was very mm -hmm. important for me to understand. And um, there's this notion that you're coming in at an executive rank, you're going to hit the ground running, you'll understand it. Uh, my approach is a little bit different, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, it's more who I am. I asked a lot of questions. I was not ashamed to ask a silly question. Yeah. Uh, why do we consider it that way? Uh, I did a couple Ryan drives. I followed some of the claims guys to see what they do out in the field. Mm -hmm. but I also went to at least uh, a dozen or so agencies, um, mid-size, small, medium to really understand the point of impact that the policyholder has and how technology plays into that. Yeah. Well, I remember um, you telling me that it you felt like you had kind of a, a permission to ask ignorant questions, that that's one of the nice yeah. things coming into a new industry. Yes, I did. And and the one thing that helped is, given that we're in IT, I got a little frustrated because, you know, it's acronym rich. Everyone has their 
TLAs, right? Mm-hmm. So we actually created an app from my experience and others that we now have for new hires a list of um, acronyms. So when you're in a meeting and you want to ask that one question, you could check our little glossary and see what those TLAs stand for. Then if it's not there, oh, nice. feel free to ask that question. Okay. That's actually, that's really great. So you t- just from your own experience, you develop that. Yeah, from my own mm-hmm. frustration because um, <laughs> I was tired of being the one always asking that. Yeah. What does that mean again? Yeah. yeah. Did you find that there were, uh, when you think about the IT challenges that you were taking on as you got there, were they very, were they similar to what you were had been working with with Toyota, or were they in just a, a kind of a whole different realm? I would say it was similar. Um, oh, so there's a little bit of both. So there was a lot of antiquated systems that we had um, at Toyota Financial that we were working on transforming. Mm-hmm. Uh, every company goes through those waves. Both organizations were going through that. Um, but I would say when you think of F&I, uh, stock brokerage, cutting edge, real time, best technology out there available has to be. Mm-hmm. Um, financial services, banking, you know, it's good, but, you know, there's room for improvement. Insurances, in some cases, was considered like this lost area where technology was always a laggard. All right. Mm-hmm. We'll get to it. And yeah. what I really appreciate is when I joined the organization, there was already a momentum, a she change as to we need to do more with technology. So I kind of inherited a little bit of that spark. Mm-hmm. Um, my responsibility was to kind of fan that spark the best I can yeah. uh, and get that into a flame. Okay. No, well, that makes sense. Well, and you report now into Farmer's CEO, uh, Jeff Daly. And yeah. your first six months, you reported to the COO. And then, then you moved into the reporting relationship with the CEO, how has Correct. that been different for you as a chief information officer? That, as you know, that's often a topic that comes up at our industry gatherings and at, at events where people talk about the difference between reporting to various members of the C-suite and then mm-hmm. directly to the CEO. So uh, uh, your question's um, appropriate. So when I did start, I reported to the CEO, COO, uh, chief operating officer. And little did I know at the time that there was a plan that it was more of an interim because that individual was thinking about retiring. And, and so he did. Mm-hmm. And I actually still keep in touch with him. He gives him some guidance. And the move shifted to the CEO. And for me, reporting to the CEO, the CFO, um, you're definitely still part of the conversation. But it's a huge difference when you are a direct report to the CEO mm-hmm. um, for a variety of reasons. One is that when you're in the executive meetings, and uh, in my case, Jeff ask a question, um, I'm in the room at the point of question. There is yeah. no filtering or cascading by the time it gets to me. It's kind of watered down. Yeah, it nobody's is from translating his, what he wants. No, it's from his, mm-hmm. ear, from his mouth to my ears. It's, it's direct. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is then when there's healthy debate and tension, which there always should be, um, I'm actually at the same um, level and discussion point as my peers on the business side. And mm-hmm. the, the best thing about that is it's, it's welcoming. They realize that I'm actually at that level and we can have the banter. Ultimately, my job is to provide them two or three options. Mm-hmm. And I always highlight the one I think is the best for the organization. And we debate, is that the best as they see it as well? Yeah. So being a direct report to Jeff, who, by the way, is an amazing CEO because he does challenge everyone equally. Mm-hmm. Um, it goes a long way being at the table at the point. And then I'll, I'll make a quick reference. So my favorite play of all time is, is Hamilton. Um, I've seen it at least four times already. Wow. And there's a scene where they talk about being in the room of the discussion. I yeah. want to be in the room. Aaron Burr kept on talking about that. I think that's important that you want to be in the room during the debate and the mm-hmm. discussion, and you're not getting it a cascaded, watered-down version. Right. So that's been really um, welcome for me. Well, and it probably also gives you more exposure and experience directly with the board of directors. Yes. Yes. Um, I mean, that's, that's, that's why that's, we had to delay our, our live show today because you had you got drawn into a board of directors meeting this morning. That is correct. And that is why I'm wearing this beautiful tie and um, mm-hmm. suit. I usually don't wear the tie every day. Oh, you, don't, avoid it. you don't do the matching handkerchief and all that every day? I don't day. do that. No, this is just, I did <laughs> it for elegant. Mary Fran mm-hmm. as well as the board. Thank you. <laughs> so in your uh, experiences now that you do more presenting in front of the board, do you prepare for that any differently than you would for just a meeting with the other C-suites? Um, yes. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of preparation. What I'm learning, and I've learned this when I got into the, the leadership role back in the day in Toyota, is a lot of your time is spent on the evangelizing your work. Yes. And at first, honestly, about 10 years ago when I really got into that part of it, 
it was a little frustrating. It's like all I'm doing is a PowerPoint deck. All I'm doing is explaining and re-explaining and mm -hmm. here's an appendix. But what I've learned is that is core to the job. Um, whether I report to the board or I'm on the board or whatever, I need to be able to articulate why those investment dollars are needed. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, for today, there's a lot of prep that was done. We have an office of the CIO, and they help prep the work. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, we actually go through and we do a little a mock review to make sure is it appropriate, and we yes. poke holes in it. Mm -hmm. um, part of that is because uh, I coached my kids when they were um, young enough to be coached. And uh, I always felt that coaching is like the, the practice has to be harder than the game. So poke holes in it, stress test it in the practice period. But by the time it's showtime, you're in front of the board, everything should be ticked and tied, and no question you should not be prepared for. So, um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a lot of work to evangelize the work, but if you do it right, you actually can create tremendous momentum by doing it. Well, it, it's occurred to me over, especially in recent years, that CIOs have to do more evangelizing and educating from their roles than they ever had to in the past. I mean, some of that is because of the digital transformation happening at different companies, but it just, it, it used to be one of those also ran social skills, kind of, oh yeah, on the soft skill side of my job, we should do this and this. But it seems to me now that it's much more central to the role. Right, do you see it, that? Do you feel that? It, it is absolutely essential. And one of the mm -hmm. reasons, I said one of many reasons, and I'll just log like one big one, is that the business unit you know, is far more, more, far more tech savvy than ever before. Yeah. They have the ability to go to the same conferences I go to. The white papers are everywhere. Consultants want to give them an idea and they listen to those ideas. So mm -hmm. the forces are there. Nothing is now just within the IT realm. Right. That's one thing. And I think the second big thing is that the experience there, and everyone's talked about this, but I think it needs to be mentioned again, the personal experience with IT is quick it's easy it's simple mm -hmm. all right so they could go to an apple store they could go to best buy whatever it is and it's really easy to understand and comprehend yeah they come into the corporate environment and ron is telling them that this website is going to cost x amount of millions and x many months or years and so my job is to make sure to explain yes mm -hmm. uh, going to a retailer is pretty simple this is your home environment you have to harden it from data and other concerns yeah but here in corporate america and corporate environment you have to lock it down and that comes at a cost mm -hmm. but you have to explain those deltas and why it is and once they get that and they understand it and 99 percent of them do they mm -hmm. say okay i understand why the investment's needed let's move forward but you do have to um, continuously have that conversation with the board with my peer group and even our own staff yep. why can't we do it cheaper Okay. Well, um, when you first joined Farmers, what were your march marching orders? What was your overall mission from the CEO? And what sort of things did he ask you to prioritize? Oh, there was three big ones. Um, mm -hmm. First one was replacing our legacy system. Every company is going through a phase, a wave, and we, we're no different. We're replacing our policy center, sorry, our policy system. Um, we're also replacing our claim system, and it's been in place for many years. Mm -hmm. um, however, before I joined, uh, a discussion was had and a contract was signed, which I completely advocate, advocate but my mm -hmm. job is to make sure we deliver upon those systems. Mm -hmm. And they're not inexpensive systems. They are going to touch every part of this organization on the policy side as well as claim side. So transforming those old systems is, is critical. Mm -hmm. um, he said that is definitely something you're, you're responsible for, and I was like, I'm ready for the challenge. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one was um, creating a better relationship between IT and the business. Yeah. It, for me, I, I, I struggle with, as I said earlier, being the order taker in the room. Mm -hmm. Like you walk into a room, you're invited halfway through the meeting, you see slide number 32. You realize you just missed 31 slides but you're told to execute on something that you've never seen before. But it's your mm -hmm. job to execute it. And, uh, but that's because the relation between business and IT is always, or in some cases, strained. Mm -hmm. So let's be in the conversation for the first 31 slides so we can actually have a better understanding of what it needs to be delivered and what are the outcomes. So the second big one was better engagement with uh, the employees, clearly, um, re-engaging the agents. We mm -hmm. have well over 13,500 agency storefronts in the United States actually more storefronts than Starbucks in the U.S. And so, that's in addition to the independent agents, those 50,000 out there. That is mm -hmm. correct. So okay. there's a, a lot of that. Um, so it's very important that we have a right engagement with the agents and the customer. And the third big one, um, which is the exciting stuff, 
well, it's all exciting, but this one's really exciting, is created and um, why I dubbed it the, uh, my team, not me, uh, the iEcosystem. Mm-hmm. So as you mentioned before, in my past life, we created an iLab. Yeah. It went well, but there's a lot of learnings. Like it's mm-hmm. not just about having a lab. It's about creating the right mindsets, bringing in design thinking, talking about agile, mm-hmm. um, partnering with academia. So creating this iEcosystem, ecosystem, and it's now it's in it's going to be its third year coming up, and it's actually proven quite successful thus far. Well, good, good. And we'll definitely talk more about your innovation okay. ecosystem. I, I really want to drill into that a little bit more. But okay. um, let's circle back on the legacy replacement. That can be a really huge cultural challenge for any company. I mean, you're going to spend, I think you told me, in your two major waves on it, and the first is going to, you're investing nearly a billion dollars on just that That's first right. wave of it. But how did you get how did you get people on board willingly? I mean, it's one thing the CEO can come in and say, this shall happen and we shall do this, but then there can be all kinds of passive resistance. So you probably had to do a certain amount of selling it to the other business unit leaders. How did you go about that? So there was and there wasn't. So I'll, I'll, I'll mm-hmm. reset. So when I joined, there was already the, the ink was signed. We're going to move forward with these programs. Yeah. But then there's the actual doing part. And... I would say the thing that's been the most helpful, a couple of things. One is we do market analysis. What are other companies doing? And in some cases, it's not about innovation. It's not about Kaizen. Mm-hmm. It's about truly just keeping up with the neighbors, keeping up with the Joneses. You kind of have to do that to stay competitive. So that debate has already been had, and everyone agreed we need to do these system upgrades right. because the cost of making one change um, was just astronomical because we had to touch so many different lines of code in the legacy system, as everyone knows. Mm -hmm. Um, The second part, though, is getting the hearts and minds of people say, hey, this is a journey. There's going to be some hiccups. Um, I am fine to see a scorecard that has red on it. It doesn't mean, you know, it's over. It means that there's something we need to really focus on and get us to yellow or green. So my behavior also is very important to show that I will not overreact. I will not do the chicken little skies falling. Mm -hmm. I will say, okay, how can we advocate to get this right? Mm -hmm. The third big one to kind of get things going was, I think it was truly the business. They did something that I really appreciated. They assigned senior executives on the claim side as well as on the policy side to own the transformation. And as we do the evangelizing of what we're trying to accomplish, we always say it is a business initiative, it's a business transformation with a heavy IT lift. Mm -hmm. Because my concern is if you make it a purely IT project, it doesn't have the gravitas, it doesn't have the support it needs. These are truly business-led initiatives with a heavy lift from the IT team. Yes. So both teams sit on the same floor, they intermingle. Oh, Half the time okay. I can't tell if it's a business person or an IT person, just like in our digital space. Yeah. And that's very important. And those two individuals that I referenced, they know the industry really well, which is really great. Mm-hmm. But they also have, I would say, the... Uh, je ne sais quoi. They have the understanding and ability to push back under business peers mm-hmm. where we want to stay at 85 percent conformance out of the box. Yeah. Um, and the business keeps on saying, well, we want to add this and that. Yeah. They're questioning their business peers. What is the value of that in this new system? Mm-hmm. And they're going through that vetting and the filtering. And it not only controls scope creep, it keeps us within our conformance, high school conformance scores. So yeah. those two individuals are doing a phenomenal job of that. So I am. I'm blessed that that's kind of how we constructed the organization where business ownership, IT delivery, the Mm -hmm. teams are intermingled. Well, and and as you're talking about this, I'm reminded of a joke I heard at one of our conferences a few years ago where, and I think it was from a business person where he said there were two kinds of projects, IT failures and business successes. (laughs) And and, and it's nice, it's nice that that attitude is actually starting to uh, kind of like alleviate a little bit, you know. Now it feels like one of the. It feels like a more old-fashioned joke now than something that's that's truly current. Um, yes. Now I, another. So that's when we talked about your your big initiatives that you have. The first one is the legacy systems replacement. The next one is essentially. Um, improving the levels of customer engagement with those three yeah. customer groups that you have. And that's a very high impact move for CIOs to do, especially new yeah. ones in the first couple of years. Um, it, talk about the kind of things you've done on that front. Um, you could start with the Lotus Notes when you got there. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's that a good still point. shocks so, me a little bit. <laughs> I, I, I'll start with that one. So that yeah. one was interesting. So mm-hmm. 
when I started with the organization, uh, I have a phenomenal executive admin. And she approached me and said, oh, Ron, welcome. Here's your mm-hmm. password to this, that, and the other. And here's your lowest notes password. And I remember pausing and I looked at her like she was joking. She said, no, this is your lowest notes password. It is whatever. Mm-hmm. And I was like, how are we on lowest notes? She's like, well, we've been working on a pilot for a couple of years and we haven't been able to figure out the calendaring. So, um, wow. so yes, yeah, it's, it's a pilot right now. So I remember walking over to whoever was on my staff that doesn't ask more questions. And we made a commitment by the end of the year that we're going to pull the Band-Aid off and move over to um, Outlook. Mm-hmm. Um, so we did that. It, we got it done within a year for most of the organization, and the rest is you know, we're cleaning up the rest of that. But the really important part of that is the, the, the notion that someone came to me and says, oh, my God, that's really innovative, Ron. You got us off a lot of notes. Mm-hmm. I kind of chuckled inside because it's not innovation. That is definitely Kaizen. It's keeping up with everyone else. So there was that sense of, okay, we don't want to trip on ourselves. We can't get the calendaring right, so we're not going to try it. And so mm-hmm. it, there's a known issue with the calendaring. We know that, so let's just get past that and educate the business that for a period of time, we'll have some calendaring issues, yep. partner with us, and we'll get on the other side of the hill. And, and we did that, and the team did a great job doing that. So that was, that was a big one. And yeah. um, from that, though, and the way I kind of think, is that I know that I have to deliver, and my team has to deliver tangible, real wins, and that builds momentum for the next opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, so that launched us into, okay, we need to create an innovation lab. Well, how are we gonna create that? Well, let's just find efficiencies elsewhere, offset those efficiencies, and pay for the lab, and which we were able to do. And the room I'm talking to you from right now is actually the innovation lab that opened actually a year ago this month. Okay. So. Um, that was the second one. And the third one, I would say, is um, more ownership. Um, mm-hmm. I am very lucky that when I joined this organization, the staff I inherited is a phenomenal staff of folks. Phenomenal. Driven, hardworking. Um, I wanted them to have a sense of pride of what they do, as opposed to being order takers. Hey, let's just be at the table. Let's look at all the things that we can do, mm-hmm. as opposed to be mired in stuff we can't do. So there's a psychology of kind of just coaching up the team that we can do this and I will not react when we make a mistake um, but I will definitely celebrate each time that we have a win yeah um, so that's gone a long way as well what is the the kind of the size and scope of your IT organization and since you've been there over the last two years have you done any substantial reorganizations or created any new career pathways or specific roles inside the org that's a great question so we have well over 5,300 resources or so wow. in IT. Mm-hmm. Uh, of the 5,300, approximately 1,500 are employees of farmers. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things that I was really focused on is building um, a curriculum for individuals who are interested in following a leadership track within IT or following an engineering track. Um, some of my closest friends who are in IT, um, very technical, good propeller heads, but at a certain point, they get promoted into a role where they have to lead people. And it's not their wheelhouse. It's not what they really enjoy doing. Mm-hmm. But for them to move up in a career, they have to become managers of people. So yeah. one thing working with our HR team, which has actually been extremely productive, is how can we create career tracks for individuals um, was very important. The second one is I have something called open office hours. It's something mm-hmm. that I carried over and I saw when I was in college. And so people could log on a, a log through my, my um, executive admin time. 20, 20 minutes. Uh, mm-hmm. I have an hourglass for dramatic purposes. I turn it upside down. Mm-hmm. And in those 20 minutes, they could ask any questions um, and we could have a good open dialogue. Three rules. Rule number one is you're not here to complain about your boss. This is not what this is about. <laughs> Rule number two um, is that if you come with a problem, please come with a potential solution and let's mm-hmm. talk about that solution. Mm-hmm. And rule number three, four walls rules. Whatever you share stays in this room. Uh, of course, unless it's an HR-related matter that it has to be kind right. of uh, escalated. Okay. Um, and that I've had probably a few hundred in the first couple of years. Um, and now I actually try to change it up a little. Um, my head of the OCIO is now creating um, flash open office hours. So somewhere on campus through our workplace tool, it says Ron's having a flash open office hours between 11 and 1. Oh, great. Please swing by, have mm-hmm. a coffee, have some drinks. Um, and try to make it a little bit more interactive. So that engagement for me is really important because I remember in my past life, long time ago, it was hard to have that relationship with leadership. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure that everyone feels connected 
uh, to the mission. And yeah. so that that's helped us a great deal. Yeah. Did you um, change the mission for IT when you got there? Did you come out with a new mission statement or come up with, uh, you know, basically the, the three rules we live by. It, it's, uh, you know, yeah, it's, a, um, it's a typical leadership move and it, it can it be, is. it can be very useful. It can get people talking about some important issues. Uh, so, so eight days on the job, maybe less, six days on the job, we had our first town hall, mm-hmm. the introduction of Ron. And I introduced them and I showed pictures of my kids dancing and, you know, just as soon as they know who I am as a mm-hmm. person. And, but then I talked about what I call my five E's and these are E's that, um, I carried over from my last role, mm-hmm. and I'll quickly go through those. Uh, the five E's, the first one is explore. Our job in IT is to explore what's next. Now, exploration doesn't mean it only can come from IT. We want the business to be part of that journey. So if the business has a great idea, we should not squash it. We should right. celebrate it and bring it in. Mm-hmm. So exploration of what's next is very important. Enabling the business is our second E. Our job is to enable the business. IT is not here for IT's sake. IT is here to enable the business. So if we're working on every project, those projects should be doing something that actually makes the business better. Mm-hmm. The third one is engagement. Um, engagement is something that's very important to me because I want to make sure not only are we engaging the business colleagues, but are we engaging each other? A lot of times you get silos within your organization. Mm-hmm. Farmers is 90 years young, and it grew over acquisition. Um, and so a lot of the technologies were separated. A lot of the people were separated. Um, make it one technology group is very important. So we're all kind of learning, build it once, use many times. Yep. Uh, the final, final two E's, um, one of them is uh, evangelized value. I want to make sure that every time I go talk to Jeff in a meeting, the conversation is not about an outage. The conversation has to be about a capability or an opportunity. So mm-hmm. um, evangelizing value is very important. Take pride in what we're doing. And the final E, the fifth E, is eliminate waste. Um, I think IT is a phenomenal is, is, is a perfect place to look across an organization and see where there's wasted effort, there's multiple tools to do the same task, yeah. and find those opportunities and create efficiencies from those. Mm-hmm. If we do those five E's right, those are basic you know, tenets or principles, um, the six magical E's that experience. We want our agents to have the best experience, we want our employees to have the best experience, and we want our customers to have the best experience. If we do those five things, yeah. um, I believe we could get there. And then the rest is in the detail. How do mm-hmm. we get there? Yeah. So, yeah, that was my, uh, I think, six days on the job is okay. when I actually presented well, those. And, I've heard and, you talk about your five E's before. Now, I guess you're up to <laughs> six E's now, right? Well, I'm trying to avoid adding E's because you can over E it. But, um, <laughs> you'll have, but your, you'll have your dirty more. dozen in no time. I'll have my dirty dozen, yeah. exactly. Well, you know, and, and that reminds me when you talk about, you know, the if you're doing all the E's right, there is probably less reason for rogue IT to uh, show up in the organization. And you had mentioned to me when we talked uh, last week that you just had a town hall where you talked about rogue IT and mm-hmm. you acknowledge that enterprise IT can actually be a catalyst for this shadow IT that jumps up. So what did you mean by that? Explain that's that. A gr- that's mm-hmm. a great question. So from mm-hmm. a personal experience. So um, so I'll tell you my personal experience. In, in, in my past life, I was working out of one of our field offices. Um, mm-hmm. And we created a system because the business was requesting that we find a way to track titles. And this was at and Toyota. So, at Toyota, at yes. Toyota. Mm-hmm. And our job was to track titles. And we just couldn't get our corporate IT to kind of either invest in it or understand what the problem was. So we created a little skunk works in, in our office, and we actually created a system to follow and track titles. It actually went really well. For about a year or so, year and a half maybe, no one no, knew this, the system existed. Um, a couple of the centers started using it. It was always kind of below the radar. And then... Um, <clears throat> One of my mentors, who became my mentor, is the first time I met her, uh, Barbara Cooper, phenomenal mm-hmm. CIO from Toyota, and we still keep in touch to this day. Member of our she CIO came, Hall of Fame. Yep. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. She uh, came to visit me and told me that, you know, what you're doing is not appropriate. You shouldn't be doing this. This is essentially embedded IT, yeah. uh, rogue IT. And we had a very frank conversation. Then she went to go talk to the business unit, <clears throat> and they saw the value. And she came back and said, okay, Ron, now how can we make this solution uh, more enterprise for the rest of the organization. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I've always saw that if we don't engage the business in a different way, if we're not creating solutions for the business, they will have to go do it themselves. And they're mm-hmm. not doing it to be malicious. They're not doing it to be kind of a thorn in our side. They're doing it because they have to deliver on something, mm-hmm. and we couldn't meet the need. So 
what I want to do is create a, 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 um, an organization where everyone's comfortable to bring it to IT. We work with it together. We take it from underneath your desk. We put mm-hmm. it into our data center. We harden it. Um, mm-hmm. And we actually celebrate that. Yeah. And uh, thus far, rooms like the Innovation Lab and such provide us that engagement. But to, to answer the question directly, yes, um, how we engage our business or how we don't engage our business can create those moments where they say, well, we got to get it done anyway. Yeah. They hire IT staff, they write contracts, and you don't even know about it until later when someone's asking, well, did you hear about those three servers that went down? Well, what servers? And then it's that moment of clarity. Oh, my God, we have a problem. Yeah. So for me, it's always been that moment. And my learning from my Toyota days clearly made me think differently about what is rogue or embedded IT. Mm -hmm. Especially since you had been rogue IT yourself. Well, yes, yes, I, I am a surviving member of such a thing. Yes, yes. I, I, yes. I was well, no, I was also interested by the way you have brought some of those those businesses that do have a you know their own private IT operation, their little private army going on. Um, you've drawn some of those IT people that were helping them do that into your organization, essentially right. to give those people more of a career path. I thought that that, that was a, correct. Thought that was a really smart way to kind of get rid of shadow IT as well. Well, the way I'm thinking about it and the way it was for me was that, okay, I've done this for three years, I've done it for four years, and I'm not in the traditional IT sense, and I'm working on the side like a satellite. Where do I go? Where's mm-hmm. my progression? So if you could actually have the conversation with them, you're doing really good here, but what do you want to do in a couple of years? Do you still want to maintain and administer these kind of hidden systems? Mm-hmm. Well, typically the answer is no. So mm-hmm. recruit mm-hmm. you into IT and let's just make this something that's more enterprise-wide. And it actually goes well. But for me, it has to be a, a discussion as opposed to a, a heavy hand. It should be a land grab. Right. It should be a, a, a conversation about risk tolerance and kind of career progression. Okay. Um, I want to circle back again. I, I continue to be fascinated with the idea of the innovation ecosystem because yeah. I've heard you use that term a couple of times. How is an ecosystem to innovate any different from an innovation group or a special unit or a digital innovation group? Uh, what what makes something an ecosystem? Great question. So for me, the ecosystem is pulling in different factors, different parameters, different skill sets to create the best solution. So I hate to do the sports analogy, but mm, coaching but kids and sports. <laughs> bringing, I can't help it. Bringing in the best free agents, bringing in the best staff, right? Finding the mix that gets you the best solutions, the diversity, candidly, the diversity and inclusion yeah. of different thoughts goes a long way. So the ecosystem we talk about is clearly the physical space. So mm-hmm. we have an iLab, which I'm sitting in today, the Innovation mm-hmm. Lab. A lot of people have that. We also have adjacent to this room something we call the X Lab. It's the experience lab. Okay, we've promoted things out of the lab. Now we want the agents and the, and the employees and the customers to actually touch it, you know, mm-hmm. break it. Right. Yeah. So that Play room is it. where they kind of mm-hmm. test it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, we don't want that room to be a museum piece. It is an active room and yeah. it's dynamic. Things are always coming in and out. Different mm-hmm. POCs. Um, but beyond that, we also want to leverage um, what we have in house. So we have something called the University of Farmers, and it's right. where our agents come in and they get trained, and our adjusters come in and get trained here in Southern California. And so we wanted to leverage that organization to help us think differently about how we approach projects. So design thinking courses. Mm -hmm. We actually have someone that's assigned to our innovation lab who does a phenomenal job setting up design thinking um, challenges. Uh, We also are want to upskill our business units and our IT team on transferring from waterfall to an agile methodology. Mm -hmm. Um, And and one example for that one is important is the way I see waterfall um, is like the business asks you a question, say go to the beach and get me a rock. So you go to the beach and get them a rock and you're coming back and forth every six months and you're like, is this a rock? No, this is not the rock. You're not really sure what rock they're looking for. Yeah. The way I kind of explain Agile is the business is with you at the beach, and they're pointing out the rock. And in real time, they're pointing out how they want the rock to be shaped, the mm-hmm. color of the rock. And so it's an iterative process. So by the time it's delivered in a year or after a sprint or whatever, mm-hmm. it is something that you both look at and say, this is what we wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, the old thinking, and there's some projects that actually make sense to still go waterfall, but the older thinking is, you do go back and forth. You deliver it after a year and a half. In IT, we have the sense of pride. We delivered it. Yay. What we didn't realize is that conditions have changed in that time, yeah. uh, regulatory conditions. The business leader who actually kind of consulted you to start that project moved on and got promoted. So you have mm-hmm. a new leader who has a different mindset. So 
for me, getting the university farmers to help us with that journey has been kind of very, very helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other two quick components of the ecosystem was reaching out to um, a company called Plug and Play that we do business with in mm-hmm. the Bay Area. And essentially, it's like Shark Tank. You say, I want to learn more about IoT. So they present several different people, um, groups, startups in front of you, and you give them a thumbs down. This will not work in our environment, but mm-hmm. here's some feedback. Why? So they learn. Thumbs up. Hey, that's a great idea. We want to invite you to our iLab, right? We invite them to iLab. We create a couple of proof of concepts together. Mm-hmm. Maybe it gets promoted to X Lab. And sometimes it actually gets rolled out to production. And I think a little later we'll talk about a few of them that actually went through that process and are in production today mm-hmm. through that ecosystem. Yeah. So, uh, and the last one is academia. Um, you got to get, in my opinion, what are the schools doing? Um, we, we're very lucky that we're down the road from UCLA. Yeah. Um, usually it's a 30 to 45 minute drive. Today it's probably a four hour drive, depending on traffic in LA. But um, partnering with UCLA to help be the tech incubator for Silicon Beach um, is part of that ecosystem as well. How mm-hmm. could we understand what's going on in that space? It not only helps us with the ecosystem, but also helps us with recruiting. Um, yes. So it's very important to help us with STEM recruiting and, and getting some um, talent into the organization. Mm-hmm. Well, and um, actually, I want to uh, pick up on what you mentioned about um, innovations that are, have actually moved into production. Mm-hmm. Between the iLab and the Experience Lab, um, what is a tangible example of something you've delivered to the business from that? Well, one of them, I, I, I can definitely speak of virtual reality. So, okay. You know, joining the insurance, I, I, I could, full transparency, I, I thought, okay, it's insurance, right? You put out a policy, mm-hmm. a call comes in, there's a claim, that's insurance. And again, that's the most Fisher Price approach and mindset to it. Um, the 50,000 foot view. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, you're talking on, on Mars. But as you start digging into it, the beauty that I actually enjoy about insurance is the use cases are everywhere. You're insuring homes, you're insuring cars. Anything has a potential peril that we have to insure against. So the use cases are everywhere. So with VR, we started tinkering with, with the idea of what if we could train our agents and our adjusters through a VR experience. Um, with as many agents that we have and adjusters that we have, um, what if we were able to teach them how to detect water or a water leakage in a house? Or if they had to fix a vehicle, what to look for, adjuster has to look for in the Ford versus the Honda. And so here in Southern California, we actually have a, uh, a space near the UMC Farmers where they come in and agents train on the latest vehicles. Sure. And how can we take that and digitize that? So uh, we worked with a company, brought them into the Innovation Lab. They did a POC um, actually a year ago, I think last January. And from that, things started getting built up more and more. Our head of claims, the chief claims officer, Keith Daly, mm-hmm. phenomenal partner, he said, wait, there's an opportunity here. So what we did is we took that idea and um, we created a full-blown water detection VR experience with 11,000 different scenarios. So one adjuster will never go through the same scenario. They could go through a home, they could touch things, they could change things, they could notice where the leakage. So when they're in the real world environment, the training becomes part of that, the muscle, right, has been Mm -hmm. built. So from that, we actually um, work with a claims team and they're now considering, and they're actually going to, not create a duplicate training facility and we've created or we're working with them to create a full VR studio as opposed to creating the brick and mortar. Um, and so Keith actually um, shared that through a press release probably two months ago. Mm-hmm. But for us, it's been pretty exciting that we're taking VR in the insurance space and we're adapting it to a real life scenario. That is, is that the Kansas City project? Is that where the facility that is the will be? Mm-hmm. That is Kansas City, correct. All right. And you said you, you eventually envision being able to just send adjusters the virtual reality glasses and they can be right at home. They won't even have to go to a location. How, that is correct. How far away is that? That is a lot closer, actually. It's probably happening in some POCs we're doing right now. Okay. Proofs um, of concepts. Mm-hmm. Proof of concepts, sorry. <laughs> and so but even in a later phase, we now work with Facebook on Workplace. You know, that actually mm-hmm. was announced recently as well. And so the idea is workplace, as you know, is it's fake Facebook for, for business purposes. No advertising, no uh, 
right. um, games. Um, but the later version, the next version of Facebook, is going to have a VR experience. Yes. So here's conceptually, all the adjusters have VR lenses or a box, really, really inexpensive. They can slide it into their phone and go onto a private site and they could learn and immerse themselves through Facebook as the delivery mechanism. Mm -hmm. So combining the technology of VR, where Facebook is going, it's creating the more, a more rich and mobile experience. Yes. And that came up through the Innovation Lab, Experience Lab, and, and now it's actually out in production. That's great. So that's one of those that went through. Yeah. Well, and another thing you've been doing a lot of work with, which people may not realize, is drones, with drone technology. Um, yeah. You mentioned that both with California wildfires and with Hurricane Harvey, uh, there are latest uh, natural disasters, and that um, farmers as well as other insurers have learned a lot about responding to and being able to process and find claims, uh, turn out the, the claims adjusters afterwards. Uh, talk a little bit about how technology, especially drone technology, plays a significant role there. Okay. So, so the concept of the drones is kind of exciting in that when a natural disaster happens, and for me, it's a little bit more personal given I lost family in, in, in Haiti and I just came back from there yesterday, mm. is that the drones will, here, here's the scenario, a storm happens, you have to evacuate, um, you're away from your home, you come back to your home and you have to inspect the home. And our claims adjusters would typically have to get on a ladder go over the roof mm -hmm. and check the roof for damages. And uh, it's a very arduous process. It's very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually dangerous also for our adjusters. In some sure. cases, we have to hire a contractor to do it for us. With the latest in drone technology, we now have contracted with a company that partners with our adjusters that will actually, um, we put in an address, the adjuster gets there, and the drone will actually hover over the home. It will map the, the rooftop of the home Mm -hmm. And then it lands, and it immediately uploads the analysis to the adjuster's phone. And from that, he can notice that 40% of this roof is damaged due to wind, um, or it's only 5% or whatever. And based off of that, the resolution, the technology is that good, you can actually make, you can determine the adjustments off of that information. Mm -hmm. It saves someone from actually going up on a roof, which is somewhat dangerous. Yep. It saves on time, and it saves on cost. So... Um, we were tinkering with this actually before this very, very interesting um, summer of storms that we had. And then when Harvey hit, it was the first chance to kind of really get the fleet out there to test it out and make sure it works well. And it, it, it has paid, um, paid back in dividends. We were able to do the mapping. We were able to kind of bring sense of normalcy, hopefully quicker, mm -hmm. to our customers. So for us, it was a real huge advancement. Other insurers are clearly doing it as well. Yeah. Um, but we were one of the first, which I'm, I'm prideful of, mm -hmm. um, that our claims team was the first to get out there. But we're now learning from that. And given that it could be beyond just um, hurricanes, given Dallas and Central Texas, where I have family, hail goes through. Um, it's the same thing, putting the drone fleet out there and seeing what kind of hail damage we have. Yeah. So it's a way to leverage technology in a whole different way to reduce risk to us, but improve the customer experience. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not something you would just naturally think of as part yeah. of insurance company technology offerings, really. That's what's so kind yeah. of interesting and fascinating yeah. about it. We have a question from one of our uh, our faithful watchers on our Twitter, okay. uh, tw our live Twitter show here. Um, what are the hurdles that you had to overcome in using drones for insurance adjustments? Um, and I presume they might be regulatory hurdles. It might have been convincing the business units uh, to get on board. What were some of the challenges? So the, thankfully, um, getting uh, the claims team on board was an easy peasy. It was more mm -hmm. about can we financially do it, right? So thankfully that was an easy one. When it comes to regulatory, it came down to who should we, should we do it ourselves or should we partner with another company that does this extremely well? Mm -hmm. And we opted to do that part. Because if we had our adjusters go out, they would have to get pilot, drone pilot licenses. Um, it just gets a little, I would say, um, complicated. Yeah. So it's best that we partner with other organizations. Um, that's the best of breed. That's what they do. And we partner with them. So I will say it was more of how do we ramp up quick enough mm -hmm. um, after uh, what happened in, in, in Houston. Yeah. So by the time that Irma hit, um, we kind of had our muscles working on that, and so we could actually move our catastrophe bus over to, to uh, Irma. Okay. 
So Excellent. it was more of the hearts and minds was already there. It's a matter of, okay, what's the best approach? Yeah. And the last thing I'll say to that is, and our head of claims actually spoke at an IT conference on Thursday. Um, drones is, I think, a stage, and the way he explained it, it's a stage to probably what's next, which is just leveraging satellite imagery. Satellite mm -hmm. imagery is getting so good, it could actually follow a five-inch um, plot on Earth. Okay. So once that gets even better, then maybe the drones will go away, or drones will be only used during a cloudy day. Yeah. So um, then you could actually balance the two technologies. Mm -hmm. Well, so. and that plays into you and I had both talked about the different emerging technologies that we all hear so much about these days. Machine mm -hmm. learning, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, blockchain. Um, yeah. are, is there anything else in that kind of emerging technology space that you are kind of more acutely interested in these days? Or are they all still in that kind of simmering pot of potentially great uh, technologies yeah. that are just around the corner? So of the ones that you quickly named, um, mm -hmm. well, IoT is something that's very big for us in yes. the insurance space. Because if we could have um, what normally would be an, uh, an object such as this, mm -hmm. and you attach something to it, and it says, well, I'm leaking, shut down the system so it doesn't leak, yeah. that will reduce a claim, it'll mm -hmm. reduce peril. Um, so IoT is one of the examples that we're definitely we're, we're working on. Uh, another one that is near and dear to me is because I think AI is the new UI. Um, yeah. The fact that when I woke up this morning and I looked at my phone and it says work, gym, home, whatever, it tells me, it's asking me mm -hmm. because it learned my patterns, right? So if we could do that with some of our systems, which we are, mm -hmm. um, we could even be more focused on the customer experience. We could be ahead of the customer's needs. And I think best customer service is when they ask that next question that you were about to ask. I think that goes a long way. Ah, um, yes. So AI is something that we're looking at, not just for our new systems, such as you know Einstein being embedded in Salesforce, which we mm -hmm. leverage, but it's also how can we use chatbots on our legacy systems? Mm -hmm. So how can they be learn, they can learn quicker? And for me, a chatbot uh. is just a new way of saying a script. We're, we're adding a little bit of intelligence <laughs> yeah. to something that was binary. It's a little right? more visually appealing. <laughs> yeah, a little more visually appealing. Yeah. Um, the one that is intriguing, and we have our chief architect actually on a couple consortiums to kind of understand what it is, mm. is, is blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, that one is intriguing because it's a bird. But we don't know if this is a bird that's an ostrich. They'll never fly. Or is it a bald eagle that's going to soar and do all these great things? It's something. We're, we're sure, certain that's yeah. something. So we're working with a couple of use cases. We're working with some of our, our, our colleagues in uh, other industries to understand what it is. Mm -hmm. And we want to be at least part of the conversation. We may not be able to leverage it or be an early adopter, which yeah. is not a problem. But um, we better be positioned to be a fast follower if necessary. Yeah. Well, and it's something that if uh, a certain customer segment gets really tied into it or maybe suppliers, other B2B partners of yours working with it, it makes sense to be kind of ready off the mark when something Correct. does start to happen. And that actually, that brings me to that, that notion we talked about as well about market disruptions. There are mm -hmm. some markets that are very ripe for disruption, some that you don't even realize they are. Everybody uses the Uber example or the Airbnb. You know, hotels were not sitting around worrying about people opening their homes yeah. and, and losing rooms that way. Is there anything like that in the insurance industry, or do you guys still feel like you're pretty far up the mountaintop in terms of no. getting disrupted? Yeah, I, I'm. So I think myself and then my CEO, and actually the whole executive board that I sit with, we're 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 all Type A folks, and mm -hmm. we know that change is, <laughs> is happening. We're being disrupted. Um, we want to make sure that we're actually in the conversation. We're disrupting ourselves where it's applicable. So the one thing I'm learning more and more about the insurance space is it's heavily regulated. We all know that. We all have Department of Insurance in 50 mm -hmm. states that we have to make sure we adhere to all the standards. Totally understood. So the entry into insurance is somewhat difficult to be a full suite carrier, yeah. right? Um, however, the disruption is coming in taking bites out of the value chain. So from the time that we you know, file, you know, put a policy together to the time file a claim, there's many opportunities where disruptors could come in and do that part of it better. Yeah. Just like your iPhone or your Android, you know, all those little apps on its own is probably not the greatest. If your whole phone was just that one app, it's useless. Mm -hmm. However, it's all those micro disruptions that create this experience that you really want. Yeah. So the way we're seeing it, I'm seeing it, is that we have to understand where those disruptors are coming from 
um, and either what's our plan to deal with that, mm -hmm. um, or are we just going to ignore it because it's a fad? So we have to be at least in the conversation. So disruption is here. There's yeah. companies out there that are finding those, you know, those those bites, and some of them actually are emerging into true um, potential game changers. Some of them are just positioned to be gobbled up by a bigger company yeah. so they could be kind of embedded into their um, value chain. Well, and it seems like the obvious thing that they will go after is your your two customer bases, your external, your policyholders in some way, yeah. and those your agents. That is I, correct. I remember there was a, a company somewhere in the southeast, uh, the name escapes me now, but they started taking bites out of um, a legacy kind of business that provided all the mapping uh, activities that pilots needed to fly. And they started okay. offering an iPad application where they could get that instead of getting it from this original provider. And this was okay. a provider that had a complete lock on the market and all of a sudden discovered that it had lost like 30% of its customers who were now using this iPad app. So Correct. it's just, you know, I, it's, it's hard to imagine how you see those things coming. I, I suppose it, it helps to work with, you know, the, uh, the Silicon Beach startups and that sort of thing. That's why you stay involved in that community, I assume. I do. And, and yeah. the one thing I'll add to that is that the user behaviors are changing. Less people, yeah. my son's driving, which is surprising. He's 16 and he said, I want a, I want a car mm -hmm. or he's going to use my hand-me-down car. Mm -hmm. But I know a lot of his friends don't want to have a car. They don't want the trouble, the problems. They'll Uber wherever they want to go. They'll just partner with a friend. So they're I waiting, remember when I was waiting 16, for self-driving cars, right? <laughs> exactly. So that is changing. So yeah. the market's shifting. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's important. And the other one is that um, when it comes to um, user-based insurance, is where people are actually just buying insurance for that moment in time they just really feel like they need it. Yeah. And so that's changing kind of the market as well. So we have to understand what does UBI looks like um, and how are we going to fit in that space. Mm -hmm. Well, and I also wanted to get you to talk a little bit. You've always been very passionate about your support for different the STEM programs, the science, technology, engineering, and math, and focusing on getting younger kids into IT. Uh, usually when I have talent management conversations with CIOs, we're talking about finding developers and you know getting the new college graduates. But your interests have definitely been, been among, among the youngsters. Uh, talk a little bit about the programs that you are involved with and the ones you think CIOs should be other CIOs should get involved with? Okay, great question. Yes, I do have a passion for that. Um, so five years ago, maybe five and a half years at this point, um, we started uh, CIOs in Southern California, Jim Rinaldi at JPL, Cindy McNeese was in the entertainment at the time, mm -hmm. um, and a bunch of other CIOs in the area felt that we need to do something more. So we created a nonprofit called STEM Advantage, mm -hmm. and STEM Advantage focuses on underserved communities and women who are interested uh, to pursue careers in STEM. Excellent. And they're usually going to schools, um, kind of the California state schools. And that, that was the goal. And so we provide mentoring, scholarships, and internships for these students. And thus far at Toyota, I believe that they converted a few into employees. Mm -hmm. And here at Farmers, I believe three in my two-year tenure thus far have gone through the program and have now become employees of Farmers. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I, I'm passionate about that because I think – we are losing that, and it's just not a paid political statement or anything, but I think we're just losing the mathematics side of who we are as a society. We are quick to outsource that or look elsewhere, mm -hmm. and I think our kids need to find that you don't have to be, um, you don't have to join the military, which is great if you want to. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a sports fan or fanatic, or you don't have to be able to dance great to have a great career, and technology is a really great career to get into. But we have mm -hmm. to give them examples. We have to give them opportunities to be excited about that. So mm -hmm. um, this summer, our interns had a hackathon, and they actually started inviting middle school kids, and they did a hackathon here on campus. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing we're working on. And we're partnering with UCLA, and we're now creating a partnership with USC. Um, the Dr. Dre, Jimmy Ivey um, Academy is about innovation. So that's we're trying great. to create those partnerships as well. Mm -hmm. So for me, I'm very excited about that because I think – we're missing out on our opportunity to kind of get our kids into this. Yeah. And the last thing I'll say on this is well, my daughter just started college two months ago. She wants to go Congratulations. You know, poli sci. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Poli sci and pre law, I think, is today is what it is. We'll see what it changes. Okay. Um, my son, who's a junior, wants to go back to Chicago for school and he wants to go into STEM. He wants to do engineering, mm -hmm. game design. So yeah. 
for me, I think, you know, I just want to make sure that the next generation is well established. Um, I'm not mm-hmm. saying I'm ridiculously old, I'm ridiculously young, mm-hmm. but I think we're missing out on that opportunity. Yeah. So other CIOs out there, I implore you, please, mm-hmm. if you can, if you're not doing it already, please do more of it. Um, let's get our kids into the STEM fields. That'll be really exciting. Yeah. Well, I, I've long maintained that what we really need to give this a boost is we need a popular TV show. Think about all those CSI shows and all the kids that now grow up wanting to be forensic pathologists. Think about what forensic yeah. pathologists do for a living. And I mean, if they, if, if you can, a TV show can make something like that really attractive, then why can't mm-hmm. we do that for IT? You, That's you, a good idea. You just got to ask the, yourself. Uh, <laughs> we need, we need to, uh, you know. Just, We'll have to come up with some great titles. We'll work on that. Um, we'll work on that one. I'm, uh, and I'm always into this kind of uh, segues nicely into uh, one, of our, um, one of my last questions about uh, your talent challenges. It, it has seemed to me, I've been covering the IT field for a couple of decades now, and yeah. it seems like there's always a shortage. CIOs are always worried. There's always that conversation about getting and keeping the right people and, and especially recently technology people that can also have those business conversations. Um, is, are, are things substantially different today than they were two or three years ago? Or is this the same problem in just our 2017 version of it? What, what, do you, what do you think about the talent challenges that are out there and how you're approaching them yourself? Okay, that's a great question. So I'm, I'm a little, I'm two, two camps on this one, and mm-hmm. hopefully they're so positive, they're still positive, not going to work, <laughs> is that Farmers is 90 years young, and there's a lot of tenured individuals at Farmers. And what I've always found fascinating is that those people with the greatest tenures have gone through tremendous change. Yeah. They've gone from a mainframe world to a distributed system world to the web. They've gone through change, mm-hmm. right? They understand change. They can adapt to change. Um, so a lot of my open office hours, I always want to reach out to um, everyone, especially those who are greater t- tenure. Millennials, we'll have a quick millennial conversation. I'm not here to, I'm not going to offend any millennials. Clearly, I have a couple of millennials of my own. Um, but there is this a desire that, okay, I have a project today and um, a lot more migratory. Um, when I grew up, hmm. you know, working for a company for your whole career was normal. It was really normal. So when I left my last company, the hardest conversation was actually telling my mom, that I'm leaving this company after 19 years. I mean, I remember at the front door knocking on it. I was like, what do I say? I was like nervous. So, like I was asking someone, <laughs> mom, for a date. It was like really awkward. She's like, and what I are you thinking, her, son? Exactly. <laughs> you know. And the first question was, well, what about the kids? Well, what about me, mom? Yeah. So that was the first one. Um, but the ability to give millennials a mission, giving them something that they could touch, they could feel that they're adding value, mm-hmm. whether their tenure is three years or five years or whatever mm-hmm. it is, you have to give them a sense of purpose. And I think that's not just for millennials. We all say, well, millennials want that. I think everyone wants that. Mm-hmm. Everyone wants a sense of purpose. Working for farmers, the thing I really enjoy is that when there is a challenge, there is an issue, we're the company that people call, and we're there for them in the, in the most dire moments. Mm-hmm. When the wire fires hit here about two months ago, um, I was actually offshore in India, and my family had to get evacuated. So I knew that my company was keeping an eye on that community. And to be part of that for me is is, is powerful. That mission Mm -hmm. a millennial would gravitate to and someone who's heavily tenured would gravitate to. So for me, I've always loved doing is connecting the IT team to the mission, to the business mission. Yes. Because we tend to be the Wizard of Oz behind the scenes (laughs) or where the Wizard of Oz is Wizard of Oz, right? So how do we connect them to the mission and Mm -hmm. connect them to the employee, encourage Mm -hmm. them to do ride-alongs? encourage them to go see an agency's office. I think that really connects them to the mission and why they're working late nights, long weekends, they're away from their family. Yeah. Well, um, that's a great answer. Thank you very much. And I, I always like to ask you this because you're one of, one of those CIOs who still reads books. God bless you. I love to hear that. Um, do you have a, a reading list, something that you kind of use to keep yourself on the sharper edge of business understanding or where technology is going? Anything you want to recommend? I, I used to, I've read them all, the, the Coveys, the, the books. Yeah. Um, Martha Heller has a couple great books that I've read that kind of keeps me going, kind of the, the nature of IT. Um, 
Jill Deshay has a great book on mm-hmm. the new IT. So those are the books that I, I, I've read, and I think you just go through any of them. But the, what I actually found, and when you asked me this question earlier, I started going through, and they're all the books that everyone's read. But what I found myself doing more and more of nowadays is I'm reading trade articles from MIT Review or mm-hmm. Stanford, mm-hmm. because learning about distributed systems, that's kind of been there, done that. Yeah, It's what's on the horizon. Mm-hmm. Or even more importantly, is how are people taking AI, VR, um, drones and matching those different technologies into a new experience for a customer. Yeah, those are the ones that I gravitate gravitate to mo- uh, the most to. And this is not a shameless plug, but it's absolutely accurate. Um, CIO Magazine, which you guys put out mm-hmm. there. When I see your websites, they're quick reads mm-hmm. because a lot of time I'm I'm very mobile. Uh, yeah. Again, yesterday or two days ago, we talked. I was on a plane coming back from the Caribbean. Yeah. Um, having those quick sound bites. Here are the salient points. And if you want more information, you click this and you can get more depth. But for me, that's kind of where I gravitate to. Those magazines, those publications, those websites. Yeah. Because they're they're current and things are so dynamic nowadays that just like the news cycle, you have to kind of keep up with that. And then how does this fit into your organization? Yeah. Well, and you, you've also always been great about staying out there in the industry and going to, uh, you know, I've seen you at a lot of our own events, and it always uh, it always makes us feel good that CIOs connect with each other so well at these events. It's, you know, we try to put on a good program on the stage, but the real reason they come is to network with each other. And what's uh, fascinating about CIOs is it doesn't matter what industry you're from. Everybody's trying to solve very similar problems. And just being able to talk to somebody face to face, that still matters. It, it's uh, it's going to sound kind of weird, but it's kind of therapeutic. <laughs> it's yeah, kind of like, yeah. um, sure. it's, like a, it's, a, it's like a session. It's like, okay, you're in mm-hmm. jet propulsion and you're into uh, entertainment, but we're still having the same issue with this or that. And yeah. we just have the dialogues. Oh, my God, how did yeah. you deal with that? So yeah. for me, and it doesn't have to just be CIOs, as you would, you would agree. It would be all levels of IT. You, know, mm-hmm. you could be a BSA going to one of these events. What are other BSAs doing in this space? Yeah. So um, I don't try to oversaturate it. I try to manage that. Um, yeah. But it is definitely a value add. Good. Well, my final question for you, I was just wondering, how has your CIO experience at Farmers changed you as a leader? What do you feel like you do today differently or better uh, or, or in a, a different fashion than you did two years ago when you were with Toyota Financial Services? That's a, that's a very tough question to answer. But it's, um, <laughs> I'll say um, the scale and scope of this role is um, larger than I had at Toyota Financial because Toyota Financial was a division within Toyota. Mm-hmm. Um, this role is essentially responsible for all IT, so I have CIO roles that report into me. But the thing that I've learned, um, and I've always been confident that I can build good teams. Mm-hmm. You have to have a good team. What I'm learning is with all the board meetings, with all the things that I have to do, I have to make sure that my lieutenants are able, their their competence, um, they have the aptitude. I'm building that staff um, because I won't be able to go to every function. Not possible. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, my CEO, Jeff, might have a question I'm not available for. I have to make sure that he is comfortable going to them, mm-hmm. and they're also equally as comfortable as getting in front of a board. So this morning in front of a board, um, one of my direct reports spoke at the board. I have no problem with that because mm-hmm. I'm preparing them for the next level. Mm-hmm. But it's also candidly easing me from some of the burden of doing a little bit of everything. Mm-hmm. Um, I am far from being a micromanager. Um, so my goal is to make sure that my my staff and for me, a success is if I do lose a person, all right, they leave the organization. If one day they come back or they're a CIL, I know I did my job because I prepared them for what's next for them. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, that was what I've learned the most. I can't do it all myself. Yeah. Right? I yeah. only have so many hours in the day. Make sure the staff that's with you um, are on the same mission and we have this one IT approach to what we do. Yeah. Well, that can be something that's hard for type A's to get a hold of. Yeah. You know, the, <laughs> that perfectionism thing. Well, thank you very much for spending so much time with us today. It was really great having a chance to talk to you about all these interesting things you're doing, Ron. I will um, uh, we'll be signing off now, and I just want to tell our audience you can follow us on Twitter at CIO Online. And also, if you want to see this video on demand, it will be available on CIO.com. And then there's also an audio podcast of my conversation with Ron that is available on iTunes. 
So thank you very much for joining us today. And thank my guest, Ron, Ron Garrier of Farmers Insurance. It was a pleasure having you on. Thank you, Mary Fran. Always a pleasure. Thank you.